Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a recent ruling upholds the Papers, Please provision of Arizona's SB 1070. Also tonight, the city of Phoenix considers regulating drones and will show you the musical side of a former state attorney general. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. U.S. District Judge Susan Bolton recently upheld a key provision of Arizona's Senate Bill 1070. The federal judge also dismissed a challenge that claimed that the law was enacted for racially discriminatory purposes. Here now to talk about what the judge ruled and why is immigration attorney Elizabeth Chatham. Good to have you here. Good to see you again. Thank you. Um, what exactly did the judge rule? I know it's the it's what makes the news is show me your papers and that that, um, you know, some people consider that to be the heart of the SB 1070 bill. Um, and what that means is law enforcement officials, they can make a reasonable stop because they believe that someone has broken a traffic violation or broken the law. And during that stop, they can detain that individual to confirm or verify or inquire about their immigration status. But the stop has to be for something other than I'm wondering about immigration status, correct? Absolutely, it has to be a, a stop based on some sort of violation. They must have um, done something, their action may have um, caught the attention of a law enforcement person because they were driving and they made an illegal turn or mm -hmm. speeding or they're, um, usually it's in the context of traffic citations, right. um, and they must identify why they're being stopped. The law enforcement agent has to go and identify the reason for the stop, um, and then they can inquire about the person's immigration status. And they can inquire if they have a reasonable suspicion, or they can inquire just to inquire? Well, when you make a traffic stop, they usually will ask you for your driver's license and they'll ask you for insurance. Um, and if you cannot produce that identification document, then it can lead into the questions about immigration status. Okay, so what was the judge's reasoning to go ahead and uphold that? Because the plain language of this provision of SB 1070 doesn't appear that it would be discriminatory to anyone it should be equally and evenly applied to anyone that gets stopped. But the reality is when you look at who is in our state um, and what countries they come from, you know, the vast majority are Latino. And um, that was not taken into consideration in this decision. They, um, both the federal court, um, Judge Bolton, as well as the U.S. Supreme Court, um, I think they both are agreeing that there might be an opportunity for this issue to become ripe in the future. Um, so if someone is stopped and they feel that they're being stopped for an unreasonably long period of time mm -hmm. or they don't feel that they were told why they were being stopped, what the legal basis was for the stop, a traffic violation, or um, they appeared to be jaywalking. Um, if they're not told why they're being stopped, then they can make a claim that um, law enforcement is not appropriately enacting SB 1070. Now, explain please, because the Supreme Court, I thought, already dealt with this, and yet it's back still with the district court. What's going on? The U.S. Supreme Court enjoined certain aspects of 1070 um, and said you cannot proceed, it's preempted by federal law. But the one piece they did not preempt was show me your papers. Uh. Um, and they did go into some details about you know when it would be inappropriately applied, but again, these were speculative um, and those it, it, it was just not no one knew how it was going to be enforced. And even if you look at law enforcement agencies throughout the state, they're a little inconsistent on whether or not they feel it's important to inquire about immigration status. Um, I think that there are you know, some other issues that are important to look at when you look at law enforcement and whether or not they should be enforcing or looking or inquiring into immigration or federal law. Um, on one hand, there seems to be a burden on the person that is the victim or the immigrant 
to explain and show and demonstrate that their constitutional rights have been violated um, when you have a law like 1070 in effect. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be a difficult claim for someone to make. It's a high burden that they're going to have to meet. Um, and that doesn't really seem to be in the analysis and the decision um, that Judge Bolton issued. I think the other issue that also is important um, is that there, there's a sense of trust you need to have with your law enforcement officers and agencies. And in the last couple of years, I feel like the general public has lost some faith in law enforcement and some of the rogue officers and their actions that have been taken. Um, and I think that there's a level of apprehension, you know, with the immigrant community and how law enforcement officers are going to implement 1070. Back to the judge, though, and her decision and her ruling here. She also rejected the idea that the law was enacted for racially discriminatory purposes. That's correct. What were her reasons? Well, because the plain language of the, it, it requires a valid stop. So you can't just look at someone and identify and have physical identifiers and say, I'm going to stop this person. They seem to look like an immigrant that doesn't have papers or a criminal or something like that. You have to have a legal basis for the stop. Um, and then only once you make the stop and you know, go through the procedures mm -hmm. of inquiring about um, whether they have identity documents, at that point can you make um, an inquiry further about status. So upon the plain reading of the law, it seems like it should be applied to everybody equally. Yeah. All right. So we've got those two. Those are kind of the two major ones there. But the judge did uphold the uh, idea of the uh, day laborers and the removable offense was upheld as well. I think we understand about day laborers, blocking traffic, that sort of thing. Um, uh, again, the, the ban uh, was, was gotten, got, they got rid of that. But the removable offense failed as well. What does that mean? I, they were saying that only the federal law enforcement agency has the right to enforce um, crimes and remove people from the United States. It's not a decision that a state or city official can make. They can only um, you know, make determinations about whether they could be charged for uh, violating state or um, uh, city crimes. But this, is go this was going beyond that right. and saying, well, I am aware that this particular identity theft or identity fraud um, state violation can make you removable. That was not the, that, that was the danger, mm -hmm. um, and that's not what the judge felt was appropriate for state officials to make. Um, and then secondly, I think the day laborer provision, you know, that was a First Amendment issue um, that w was exceeding um, the rights that people have to converse, to talk, to potentially, you know, have a job. And there are other uh, traffic ordinances that are available that they could have violated. So when you look at the impact, the criminal nature of not just the day laborer, but the motor vehicle operator that would be stopping, um, it was not proportional to existing traffic um, ordinances. All right, we got about like 10, 15 seconds left. It sounds like most of SB 1070 in its original form survives. Well, I think it's really the most controversial part that did survive. And I don't think this is the end of this five-year litigation that's been going on. I don't think this is the end of it. I think so we're gonna still see some more. Someone held too long or something like that and back to the courts they go. Right, okay. right. They need the facts to be able to bring the next case. Great discussion. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you so much.
city of Phoenix is considering a proposal to regulate drones over the city limits. Phoenix Councilman Sal DeCicio is involved with writing the draft regulations. He joins us now. Good to see you again. Thanks, Thanks. for joining us. Glad to be back. Uh, your plan to regulate drones in Phoenix. Give us some ideas. Well, here. it's basically non-regulatory. What we're doing is basically outlining the parameters of where you can use them and how you can use them. And I need to make sure that uh, I give complete credit as well to Michael Nowakowski, Councilman Nowakowski. He was my partner on this. We worked together on it. And so it was something that we worked jointly. Okay. But what it does, it's going to balance the three major things, privacy, security, and commerce. We wanted to make sure we encouraged commerce, same time protecting individual privacy. Privacy from your neighbor and privacy from your government. Now, from my end of it, I really wanted to focus on government. I just don't think the government has a right to view everything that we're doing in our private lives, especially if we're not doing anything. So we have some reasonable cause uh, language in the, in the ordinance as well. So um, ideas here, you can't film or photograph, audio record up there, others on their own property with your drone? How do you how, explain, please? Well, drones are now so equipped and this technology is moving at a pretty rapid pace. So what you don't want to do is get involved in the commerce end of it, allow people to do the commerce part, but in your own private home, this is privacy from your neighbor, Ted, you want to make sure that your neighbor is not videotaping you or anyone else is, uh, or a stalker, or someone is a victim of domestic violence. Right now, you can fly a drone over somebody's home, videotape them, they won't even know that this is occurring because it can go up to 200 feet or more. Literally, you can fly a drone and they can see literally uh, some of the smallest things, smallest objects. I, I'm sure, but then you mentioned commercial purposes, mapping, uh, artistic, journalistic purposes. Mm -hmm. They're out there. I see a drone over my house or close to my house and I'm thinking I'm not crazy about that. Mm -hmm. Th this could be someone mapping. This could be someone doing some sort of art project, correct? That's correct, and they're excluded from the ordinance. So individuals that are doing commerce, as long as they're not videotaping you in your backyard, or on your, the privacy of your own personal home, whether you're inside your home or in the backyard. In the front yard, you're pretty much open game according to the Constitution. Anything in a public right away, there's not much you can do about mm -hmm. that. So let's say you're a journalist. Uh, it doesn't impact you at all. If you're mapping, let's say a real estate use, uh, where we're seeing quite a bit of this right now where people want to sell their homes, they want to market their homes, they have drones going by. They can videotape the home if they inadvertently get somebody sunbathing in their backyard, they have a completely, uh, they have a reasonable time in order to get that person off of there. Or they can go ask for the permission of that individual. So again, you can, you, if I'm a real estate person or a, God forbid, a journalist, yeah. uh, and I'm up there, and I, I'm up there, I've, I've got my drone up there, and I accidentally take a shot of you barbecuing in the backyard and throwing mm -hmm. a Frisbee at the dog and that sort of thing. Um, that still has to be removed. That's even right. though that was accidental, even though it's for commercial purposes, I gotta get rid of that. That's right. If you're in your backyard, you should have an expectation of privacy. Now, it took us, we started working on this in December of last year. And what we've heard is that this is pretty much one of the national models that they're gonna be looking at. We had individuals from the drone industry say this is one of the best things that they've ever seen. Even, because what it does is it, it has a balance. We worked with the, uh, the Goldwater Institute with the ACLU. Now imagine those two individuals mm -hmm. working together. It was fantastic. But it's a, it's a privacy and First Amendment rights are protected as well. Is it enforceable? Yes, it is. How? Well, if you think about it, you have a complete right of privacy in your own property. You have it. We do it right now with Peeping Tom. You can't be spying on somebody on your neighbor without getting in trouble. There is no ordinance right now with a drone. There's another issue, let's say over Bank One Ballpark, you go over to see a game. According to our city attorneys, they could be drones flying over there. So if you could imagine 50, 30, or even 10 of these drones flying over and they bump into each other, now you have a safety problem right. where they could land on somebody. So what we've done is we've looked at a real reasonable level and an expectation of privacy, and, but one of the biggest things that we have in here deals with government, being able to spy on individuals. And what I, you know, and here's where I, I look at it as. First of all, people know I'm more on the conservative side, so people I work with don't generally march, but others do, and people that I may not be in favor of, or, but that doesn't mean we should be spying on them. It cools free speech, is what it does. So if they know that their government is over there overseeing everything that they're doing, then it's going to cool free speech. We want to encourage people to protest their government. We want that to happen. It's a good thing, it's healthy. But 
also in terms of law enforcement, I mean, you got uh, helicopters up there chasing people right and left. They could be flying over my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have a, a drone. A, that's the procedural aspect of it, but B, how do I know that that's the police, that that's a mapping company, that that's a journalistic enterprise, or that's just my crazy neighbor trying to find out more about me? Well, the enforcement part of it is, like you said earlier, is it enforceable? Yes, it is. It's not, we, they've got mapping and they've got GPS inside of each of one of these drones. So when it lands, or if we were able to find it, we're able to determine exactly where it took off from. Hmm. We heard this from the, the, the drone industry hmm. too, because they provided an incredible amount of information. They also have, there, there's a, the, the concern dealing with the airports. A lot of these drones, the newer drones, are being equipped with uh, equipment inside that prevents them going within five miles of an airport. It's like a fence, it, sort of, right? It's exactly like a fence. So what about just registering the drone? So we just know, I mean, just, you, you buy a drone, it can go more than a couple hundred feet in the air, you gotta register it. Well, every one of them has some sort of identification on it too. What I didn't want to do is get into so the heavy, the heavy regulatory part of it. All we're looking at is there's gonna be less than 1% of the population cre uh, creating the problems outside of government. Mm -hmm. So why create a, a law that's gonna impact 99% of the people when we're really focused on the 1%? But the other part of it deals with the government end of it. We should not, we clearly should not be filming individuals in the privacy of their own home. We have a reasonable cause language in here as well that says hey, government shouldn't do this unless we have a warrant or we have reasonable cause to expect that those people have committed some type of crime. And that makes perfect sense because mm -hmm. you can, there's a lot of things government can't do without a reasonable cause. Right. Well, without right now we can cause. film you. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that you are kind of being, Phoenix is kind of being looked at as a model here. Are you guys looking at any other areas, cities, regions as a model? Yeah, we've looked at every city in the country right now. Most of them are regulatory based, either banning them or making it very difficult. We didn't want to do that. We want to encourage commerce. For example, Amazon wants to be able to deliver goods yeah. by drone. Yeah. Well, we're not saying you can't do that. You just can't film someone in their backyard without their permission. That's about the only thing that they would need to do. So with this technology, it's one of the first times that we wanted to get ahead of it. We don't want to discourage technology. We just don't want to do that because it, it's like discouraging the, uh, uh, the automobile when they had the horse and buggy. You right. don't want to do that. Real quickly, uh, how mm -hmm. soon is it uh, going to be ready for vote? Well, we're going to go do, we need to do some more cleanup on this. Uh, the ACLU had some more comments and concerns that they had. We want to make sure we address that. And then we heard some more in testimony. So now we want to bring it back and clean it up. But we've gone through multiple versions of this to make sure it's clean and take care of any unintended consequence. All right. Very good. Good to have you here. Thanks, Thanks for joining Jim. us. Appreciate it. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at an artistic endeavor from former Attorney General Grant Woods, who served as the state's top law enforcement officer for eight years. Today, Woods is serving the state in a very different way. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Scott Olson show us how. So the things I'd like to cover are... First Attorney Grant Woods is holding court inside Three Leaf yeah. Recording Studio. The way I have this sketched out, they're going to be doing a lot. In order this group has already done a lot, donating projects, their time okay. and talents to the project. What started as a way to highlight Arizona musicians quickly became something more. Everyone viewed it as a chance to kind of show Arizona in a different light than sometimes um, uh, it's portrayed. It's not all divisive, ideological splits. It's a very uh, welcoming place. It's a very diverse place. It's not, a, uh, it's not a balkanized place, in my view. To see that, Wood says, you just need to listen. The first song in the record is called Ride Out the Storm. And when I wrote Ride Out the Storm, uh, I, I envisioned that it could be done, in my mind, either of two ways. You could either do it in your traditional singer-songwriter slash country version, Americana version, uh, maybe a Willie Nelson type, something like that. Uh, or it could be done as kind of the power uh, rock ballad. So uh, maybe a meatloaf or Kid Rock or Michael Nitro. About two in the morning, he did his first vocal on it. 
and uh, it was absolutely on the money. Each song from the project started like this. At the end of the battle, Woods penned all ten songs. I viewed this as a collaborative effort. I wanted them to, to run with it and put their own stamp on it. And they did. Listen to Mindy Harris's take on Blues Hotel. I got the lights down low. And here's how Lawrence Zubia interpreted Mexican Dreams. I came here to get away. What would happen if I just stayed in my Mexican dream? Everything isn't how it seems. His lyric writing was just jumping out all over the place for me. While Richardson jumped at the chance to be part of the project, we caught up with them at the CD release party. It paints a different picture of Arizona, and it also tells a deeper story of Arizona. I think that it's time to get out. They travel the country or the world, and they say they're from Arizona. And oftentimes they get kind of a, a look or a reaction. Like, why, why would you live in Arizona? Because they don't, maybe those people have only heard some of the craziness that's come out of Arizona. Arizona has a great story behind the scenes, and music is a great place to start because the musicians that have started out on Mill Avenue have toured the world, and, and, and people wonder, where did this come from? And you say, Tempe, Arizona, they go, wow, where's that? But if you focus back, you follow it back, you'll see that there's a lot of musicians right here that don't play the same way they play in LA, don't go to Nashville, they haven't gone to Seattle because there's an organic feel right here that's natural to Arizona. And now the spotlight is shifting to that. They also hope to shine a light on the next generation. The main thing, especially related to this project, is that we keep funding any part of the education system that's going to reach into the creative nature of children because we lose that and as adults we have to regain it and it's always a struggle to regain it in the midst of uh, uh, raising kids, having a profession, uh, things of this nature. But if it's brought up as a natural part of us, a natural part of our growth in the education system, supported there, then these kids don't have a problem going out and supporting their art. Even if they want to be a neurosurgeon, they'll still learn to play the saxophone and be in a jazz band. Or in the case of one former attorney general, set aside politics and pick up a guitar. I've been to 10 million political events, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, even at the successful people in the room, they're always looking over their shoulder. They're always looking beyond the person they're talking to. And they're always, there's jockeying for positions. There's only a certain number of positions. Okay, so they're like, well, you know, I don't, I don't want that guy to do well because that, you know, he may run for this office and that blocks me. And it's all this nonsense constantly. We had, when the record was done, the singers had not heard the other, uh, most of the singers had not heard the other people's songs. So we had a, a party at my house where everybody came over the musicians, the singers, and then we listened to the record. And I'm telling you, that was really an amazing experience uh, for everybody. Everyone in there was pulling for everybody else, and they were genuinely excited. Blaine Long is a good example. Uh, some of the people in the room had not uh, ever heard Blaine Long. They heard him sing the song called Me and Preacher. First time I met Preacher was in a park downtown. Phenomenal, beautiful voice, great songwriter. They were blown away and all positive. I was looking to be found. All they wanted was to uh, have everybody succeed. All they wanted was for, at the end of it, to have something we could really be proud of and to be moved by.
A concert to benefit the Arizona School for the Arts will take place Friday night in downtown Phoenix. You can learn more at theprojectaz.com. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Arizona Artbeat is made possible in part by the Flynn Foundation, supporting the advancement of arts and culture in Arizona.